And so if you haven't opened your Bible or Bible app, uh, please do so uh, to Matthew 6. Uh, We are in the second week of our series in the Lord's Prayer. And this week we are going to focus on the statement, hallowed be thy name or hallowed be your name. And what is in a name? A rose by any other name would smell just as sweet. A little Shakespeare for you this morning. (laughs) What is in a name? I think we would all say there is a lot in a name. There are certain names that when we hear them, smiles come to our faces. If you want to put a smile on my face instantaneously, say the name Mindy. Or say the name Rue. Or say the name Herman Bavink. That's my wife, my dog, and my favorite theologian. (laughs) So there are some names that when we hear them, we respond with joy and adoration and and affection. They, they, They bring smiles to our faces because we've associated great things with those names. But there are also names that we treat sort of like he who shall not be named. Like if we hear the name, we cringe or maybe we even get angry. Osama bin Laden, Kim Jong Un, Tom Brady. (laughs) When you hear those names, we have this visceral response. I don't like that person. That person is evil or wicked or a cheater or just somebody that we don't care for. And is it not true that we want our name associated with the smile. We want our name to be associated with good feelings, people to like the thought of our name coming to their mind. When when our name is spoken, we want people to respond positively. And in some ways, this is good. As as Proverbs tells us, a good name is to be desired more than wealth or riches. Why is that? Because it doesn't matter how much money you have if you are a terrible person and no one respects you. Like You should care about being, your name being honored because you should care about being an honorable person. But is it also not true that we like our name hallowed, that is, honored, glorified, because we like to be made much of? Is it not true that we like our name to be loved and cherished and respected and adored because we love the identity that comes with that? <laughs> We love it when people cherish and adore us. We want to be made much of. So let me ask you this question. When you pray, whose name is most important? When you pray, whose name is most important? Names are also significant because in certain names, we can put a lot of hope in. I mean, is it not true that we put names on billboards and yard signs and bumper stickers? Is it not true that we chant and scream and celebrate and fight over people's names? People that we have put our hope in, people that we want to lead, and people that we believe can fix what's broken in our society? Is it not true that we put much significance into names of people we put our hope in? So here's a question for you. When you pray, whose name gives you the most hope? When you pray, who is it that you most put your hope in? Whose name is sealed on your heart as that's my hope? We put much significance into names. And when Jesus taught his disciples to pray, this is what he taught them. Pray this way. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. God, Father, Hallowed be your name. Glorious be your name. Great be your name. And Jesus taught his disciples to pray this prayer because in the midst of the glory of God, in the midst of God making his name known and his name making his name big, there is this great promise and this great truth for us. When God glorifies his name, he brings salvation. When God glorifies his name, he brings salvation. This is the big idea for us this morning. And here's what I want us to grapple with and to get inside, is that when we pray, when we pray, whose name we make most important, whose name we put our hope in matters deeply. It changes us. It transforms us. 
as we're going to see this morning. And so my prayer is, is that God, by his word and by his spirit, will get a hold of our hearts and show us why his name and his name being glorified is our great hope this morning. And let's start by talking about verbs. Let's talk about the verbs in the Lord's Prayer. So the verbs of hollow and come and be done and give and forgive and lead and deliver. Almost all of these verbs are in the passive imperative mood. Those of you that are language nerds, I know some of you are in here, some of you are linguists, so I know some of you are tracking with me. Passive imperative mood. Now, what, what exactly does that mean? Well, you're probably all familiar with this sense that an imperative is a command. So when Jesus taught his disciples to pray, the verbs he gave them are commands. Now, I got enough whoopings growing up to know you don't command people who are in authority over you. I wasn't that mouthy as a kid because I learned my lesson. My mom raised me well. You don't command someone who is in authority over you. And yet... When Jesus teaches his disciples to pray, the verbs he gives them are imperatives, commands. Well, what, what, what does that mean? What is going on? Well, first, we need to recognize there's a difference between a child demanding that a parent buy them a toy or give them money or let them go out and a child who is drowning in a river screaming, Dad, save me. Both come in the form of a command, but one comes in the form of a selfish command. I want you to make my name great. I want you to give me what I want. And the other is a cry of desperation. Dad, I need your power. I need your strength. Save me. One is selfish and one is relying on the greatness of another. And so when Jesus teaches his disciples to pray and gives them imperative verbs, he's not saying you get to command God. You don't get to order God around, but here is what he is saying. Pray with such urgency. Pray with such longing, such desire that the language you use comes across as a demand, comes across as a command. It speaks to the urgency, the longing, the the depth of feeling with which we are to pray to God. It's as if Jesus is saying there's no way to really grasp the strength you're supposed to pray unless we put this in the language of of command. So Jesus teaches his disciples to use imperatives when they pray. You know, in Luke 18, Jesus tells this parable of the persistent widow. And this widow goes to this judge's house and she keeps knocking on his door saying, I want you to give me justice. I demand that you give me justice. And the judge, who admits, hey, I'm not a good person, but because this woman won't stop bugging me, I'm going to give her the justice that she asks for. And Jesus said, if this judge who is unjust will give this woman the justice she asks for because she is praying and pleading with such strength, how much more will God who is just answer the prayers of his people? Jesus invites, Jesus instructs, God himself invites us to pray with such strong language. Do you know that he delights when you pray with that much urgency, that much faith, that much longing because it shows, God, I need you. It shows faith. It shows faith. So Jesus gives his disciples imperatives to pray. Now, these verbs are passive imperatives. And so that means that the tone of these imperatives are reverence. It comes across like, not as if, God, you do what I tell you, but God, would you do this? But here's the other important thing to note about the fact that these are passive imperatives, passive verbs. To pray a passive imperative is to say, God, you do what only you can do. I'm asking you to do what only you can do. The actors The action in the Lord's prayer is not us. We're not the ones doing these things. God is the one doing these things. Commentator Daryl Johnson says this about the Lord's prayer. The prayer is not what many believers have over the years thought it to be. The prayer is not let us hallow your name. The prayer is not let us bring in your kingdom. The prayer is not let us do your will. The prayer is father, you do it. 
You hallow your name on the earth as it is in heaven. You bring your kingdom on earth as it is in heaven. You make your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. We might be involved. Indeed, we want to be involved in the process of the kingdom coming, but we are not the ones making it come. The command, the urgency in the prayer, in the Lord's prayer is God you do what only you can do. God, I am urgently, passionately longing, pleading, asking, do what only you can do. When we pray, Father, hallowed your name, hallowed be your name. God, glorify your name. We're saying, God, you glorify your name. You put your power on display. You make your name known. You do only what you can do. Jesus teaches his disciples to pray with this much urgency, this much longing, this much expectation. Is that how you pray? Is that how you pray? When you pray to God, do you pray with such urgency, such expectation, such, as, such longing, it's almost as if you are commanding God? And understand, it is good, it is good, it is right that God's name be hallowed. It is right that God's name should be hallowed because he is the holy and righteous one. He is perfectly just and true. He is the source of all beauty and majesty. As Psalm 8.1 declares, Lord, our Lord, how magnif magnificent is your name throughout the earth. You have covered the heavens with your majesty. Psalm 145.3 says, The Lord is great and is highly praised. His greatness is unsearchable. What this means is, I don't care how smart you are theologically, you're never going to get to the depth of God's greatness. <laughs> and that's beautiful. We're going to spend eternity searching and, and discovering and learning and knowing the greatness of God. And in Psalm 148, 13 declares, let them praise the name of the Lord for his name alone is exalted. His majesty covers heaven and earth over and over and over again in scripture. The name of the Lord is exalted. It is hallowed because this is right and good because of who God is. But it doesn't stop there. It doesn't stop there. Over and over and over again, Scripture also makes this very clear. When God glorifies his name, he brings salvation. When God glorifies his name, he redeems his people. He transforms his people. He rescues and he saves. Let me, let me give you just a sampling of this from Scripture. In Isaiah 63, verses 12 through 14, the prophet Isaiah talking about the, the great exodus that Moses led and the deliverance out of Egypt, he says this, he made his glorious strength available at the right hand of Moses, divided the water before them to make an eternal name for himself and led them through the depths like a horse in the wilderness so that they did not stumble. Like cattle that go down into the valley, the Lord, the Spirit of the Lord gave them rest. You led your people this way to make a glorious name for yourself. 1 Samuel 12, 22 says, The Lord will not abandon his people because of his great name and because he has determined to make you his own people. Do you know why God will not abandon you if you belong to him? Because of his great name because his name is worthy to be praised and he glorifies his name, he hallows his name. Psalm 23, three says, he renews my life. He leads me along the right paths for his name's sake. Why does God renew our life? For his name's sake. Psalm 25, 11 then says, Lord, for the sake of your name, forgive my iniquity for it is immense. Psalm 79, nine says something similar. God of our salvation, help us for the glory of your name. Rescue us and atone for our sins for your name's sake. Jeremiah 14, 7, though our iniquities testify against this Lord, act for your name's sake. Jeremiah was so overwhelmed with the sin of the people and he's like, what, what can be done about the sin of the people, such great sin? God, glorify your name because in that we are rescued and redeemed. And then the prophet Ezekiel, when, he, when he's speaking of the 
great redemption that God is going to bring to his people says this, therefore say to the house of Israel, this is what the Lord God says. It is not for your sake that I will act house of Israel, but for my holy name, which you have profaned among the nations where you went. I will honor the holiness of my great name, which has been profaned among the nations, the name you have profaned among them. The nations will know that I am the Lord. This is the declaration of the Lord God when I demonstrate my holiness through you in their sight. Look, you and me, we've profaned the name of the Lord. It's not for our sake that God redeems and restores, but for his name's sake. When God glorifies his name, he brings salvation. And in that salvation, though, we are redeemed and restored. We benefit so, so I want to I make something clear here because sometimes we can pit two things against each other. Sometimes we can get into theological debates. Well, why does God save? For his name's sake or because of love and grace? And people actually fight about this stuff. They, they try to tease out and parse out God's motivations. But what God has put together, let no man pull apart. <laughs> over and over and over again in Scripture, it says when God glorifies his name, when he does something for his name's sake, he brings salvation. His people benefits. Now, does this mean that God's glorifying his name is ultimately just about us? No. But don't think that God is just coldly glorifying his name out there as just some God out there going, my name will be glorified whether you like it or not, and that's the end of it. No, God is gracious. God is gracious and loving He is so gracious that he is determined when he glorifies his name, his people will benefit. He he is so gracious that he has acted so that when he reveals his glory, we get to participate in it. We get to experience it. And through that, we're redeemed. But make no mistake, it is gracious. It's undeserved. we, We don't deserve to experience God's glory. We don't deserve the redemption that his glory brings. We haven't earned it. If anything, if anything, we have unearned it. It's not because of something that we have done. No, what we have done actually deserves God to withdraw his glory. It's not something that we can demand. Rather, it's something we receive and submit to. Because friends, if we're going to experience the glory of God that brings salvation... We have to turn from our own glory. We have to turn from making our name great. We have to turn from our sin and our selfishness and our pride. Or we have to turn from putting our hope in other people. Or we have to turn from trying to fix what is broken in ourselves and a world through our own efforts or putting our hope in our education or our technology or our politics. We have to turn from all of that and turn to the glory in the name of God. But here's the good news, friends through the glory of God and by his name we can experience salvation when we turn from sin and self and we turn to the glory in the name of God we can be rescued and redeemed and renewed when we turn from sin and selfishness and pride and we turn to Jesus Christ the one who came to do the will of his father the one who came to glorify God to hallow the name of God and how did he hallow the name of God how did he glorify the name of God by laying down his life on a Roman cross to be the punishment and take the penalty for our sin. See, on the cross, Jesus hollowed God's name. And what happened? Salvation. (laughs) Jesus came and he glorified the name of God and it brought about our salvation. And now through the death and resurrection of Jesus, we can experience forgiveness from the guilt of sin. Through the death and resurrection of Jesus, we are set free from the power and the shame of sin. Through the death and resurrection of Jesus, through Jesus glorifying the Father, we are invited in, we are welcomed in as adopted sons and daughters of God, loved and cherished, and we belong to the family. And through the death and resurrection of Jesus, through Jesus hallowing his Father's name, glorifying his name, we now have this incredible hope that one day Christ is going to return and renew and restore all things. This is the grace of God poured out on those who turn to him. Christ glorifying and hallowing his Father's name and through that salvation. So friends, when you and I pray 
the Lord's Prayer. When we pray, hallowed be your name, Father. Here's what we're praying. Here's what we're asking. God, with all the urgency, with all the longing of a command, we're saying, God, rescue us. God, redeem us. God, renew and restore us because we need rescue. We need redemption. We need to be renewed and restored. God, put your glory and your goodness on display because it's in your glory, your goodness, your power that we're redeemed and restored. We have no other hope. We have no other power. There's nothing else that can fix what's broken in us and in our world but your glory. So hallowed be your name. Friends, the Lord's Prayer is a God-glorifying, gospel-centered prayer. Rescue, redemption, renewal, transformation, God's glory, God's power. That's the Lord's prayer. (laughs) That is what we are praying. We are praying the gospel when we pray the Lord's prayer. And so friends, when you pray, when you pray, do you pray using passive imperative verbs? Do you pray with urgency and longing? Do you pray with with an angst and a desire, God, rescue, God, save? My guess is, for those of you that do pray or have prayed, my guess is that you have prayed with a sense of urgency. That you've had those moments, you've had those experiences where you did pray with urgency. You prayed with longing, and you probably even prayed consistently for an extended period of time. You've had those moments. And I wonder what they are. What what is it that you prayed for? What is it that you longed for? What is it that you went to the Lord repeatedly for and cried out to? I bet there were some good things there. Desire for reconciliation and marriage. Help to be a good husband or wife. Lord, help me be a good parent. Lord, save my kids. Maybe you prayed for strength in the midst of a job that felt like a living hell going to it every day. Or maybe you prayed for a new job, or maybe you prayed for a financial need. Maybe you prayed in the midst of battling chronic illness and prayed for healing, or maybe battling mental illness. Maybe there, there was just this prayer, God, my body just feels so broken. Will you, will you step in and do something here for me? Maybe you prayed with the urgency that someone that is far from Christ, does not know Christ, would come to know Jesus. Maybe you pray for urgency to see justice in our city and justice in our community and throughout our world. You're looking at all the crazy that's happening, like, God, would you please intervene and fix what's broken in society? Look, all of these things are good. We should be praying for these things. God delights to hear these prayers from his children. But here's the question we have to ask ourselves. In the midst of our prayers, in the midst of crying out with that urgency and that longing, what longings and desires were more deeply fostered in our hearts? Like through that process of prayer and crying out, what longings, what desires, what agenda begin to take root in your heart and to, to be birthed in your heart and strengthened in your heart? Or was it the thing itself that became the deepest longing and desire of your heart or did you begin to see that thing through the lens of something greater? In your prayers, did your name, your agenda, your desires, your wants, your needs become the thing that most filled your heart, or is it something greater? Friends, how did that prayer change you, affect you? What was the outcome? What was your expectations in those prayers? Well, what was it that most captured that urgency and that longing? That you had. And even now, as you think about your prayer life, what most captures your longing? What most captures the things that 
you desire? What what most captures what will cause you to sort of perk up and say, yeah, I need to pray about that? Is it your name? Is it your agenda? Or do you filter those things through something greater? And here's also what I I want you to kind of come to grips with. Is that wrestling through that, (laughs) wrestling through that is not easy. Like, here, praying for good things, I I think sometimes we can actually shy away from it sometimes because we're like, I don't want to make that an idol. I don't want to make that an idol. I don't want that thing to become too big and so we don't pray at all. And, and, And yes, It's a really subtle thing that happens in our hearts when a good desire becomes an outsized longing. I mean, that's a subtle process and sometimes takes time. And how even do you really discern that? Like, be honest. Think of the thing, something that is good that you desire. And, And as you've wrestled with that and as you cried out to the Lord for that, how do you know if that thing has become an idol? Because friends, I want, I want to, and, and maybe this will set some of you free this morning, I want you to, hey, that pain of unmet desire is not the same thing as idolatry. Like, it is okay to carry the pain of unmet desire. Now, can it become idolatry? Yes, but it isn't in and of itself idolatry. But I think sometimes we get wrapped around the axle with that. How do we determine How do we figure out whether or not our hearts have actually shifted into idolatry? Well, look, yes, on one hand, we do need to grow in some self-awareness. We do need to assess, like reading God's word, praying, being in community where we can be counseled and discipled. That helps us process growing in self-awareness is something we need to be committed to. And there are probably some of you here this morning that that need to grow in that some more and commit to that some more. But here's also what can happen, and I think for too many of us this happens— That process of assessment all of a sudden becomes analysis paralysis. What happens is we jump on the hamster wheel and we start going internal and introspective and we get locked in a prison of introspection. Well, we're hunting for heart idols and we're locked in a prison of introspection. Friends, the gospel does not lock you in a prison of introspection. It sets you free. It sets you free. And so step out of that prison. Don't live in that prison of introspection, but live in the freedom that the Lord's Prayer brings. Here's what I mean. When you pray the Lord's Prayer, when you say, Father, hallow your name, glorify your name. God, in my life, glorify your name. In our world, glorify your name. God, be big, be glorious. Because it it is in your power, your truth, your beauty, that we are transformed. And so God, hallow your name. When we are praying that, when that is the prayer of our hearts, our perspective shifts. Our perspective shifts. Our eyes go off ourselves and onto the glory of God. But here's how our perspective also shifts. Rather than obsessing over introspection and hunting heart idols, our, our, our eyes are fixed on the glory of God. Rather than being internally focused, we're upwardly focused. Rather than having our eyes on ourselves, we have our eyes on the Lord. And here is what happens. God shines the light on our idols and on our sins to be sure. He reveals those things to us so that we can turn from them and repent of them. But here's how that happens. It's not through obsessive analysis paralysis. It's by fixing our eyes on the glory of God. Do you see the difference? One is self-focused. One is I got to figure out all the nooks and crannies of my light and my heart and figure out whether this is an idol or this is an idol or this is a good desire or this is a good desire. The other is let me look and desire the glory of God and he'll sort it. Friends, when we pray the Lord's prayer, when we pray, Father, hallow be your name, we step out of the prison of introspection and step into the freedom of the glory of God. Friends, what is going to set you free from idols is not your ability to be introspective and figure all that out and obsess over that stuff. It's going to be the glory of God. Look, 
The reason why my wife's name brings a super big smile to my face and other women's names don't isn't because I walk around afraid of other women, like is my heart full of lust and am, am I gonna commit adultery and, and walking around with this analysis paralysis? No, my wife's name is just glorious to me. And be honest, I love my wife. And because of that, there's freedom. Friends, it's a greater glory. It's a focus on the glory of God. It's a longing and desire for the glory of God. So when we pray this prayer, that's how we start to sort these things. Because it is when we pray and when we long for the glory of God, that God begins to work in our hearts and transform our hearts. So when we pray, hallowed be your name, in the midst of pain, in the midst of uncertainty, in the midst of unmet desires, when we pray, hallowed be your name. God, hallowed be your name in the midst of my marriage and marriage conflict. God, hallowed be your name in the midst of the struggles of parenting. God, hallowed be your name in the longing for a spouse. God, hallowed be your name in the longing for a kid. God, hallowed be your name in the midst of my job that is so hard and terrible. Hallowed be your name in the midst of my financial need and burden. God, hallowed be your name in the midst of my chronic illness. God, hallowed be your name in the midst of my battles with mental illness. God, hallowed be your name in the life of my friend who doesn't know you, my family member who doesn't know you. God, hallowed be your name in this world that seems to be running further and further from you. Hey, when that's the cry of our heart, when that's the desire of our heart, when that's the longing of our hearts, guess what happens? The glory of God becomes our hope. The glory of God becomes our joy. The glory of God becomes the thing that we desire most. And here's the good news of the gospel for us. God will glorify his name in our lives. <laughs> God will glorify his name in this world. God is going to glorify his name in your life and he's going to transform you, he's going to rescue, and he's going to redeem. Yeah, in the midst of the pain, in the midst of the unmet expectations, in the midst of the trial and the struggle. Friends, this isn't gonna be easy. <laughs> it's not easy. Friends, we're at war with our sin and an enemy that hates us. This isn't gonna be easy. But when the cry of our hearts is the glory of God, it's hallowed be your name. God, do what only you can do. Guess what? That war doesn't have to defeat us. Through Jesus, it doesn't defeat us. You want to glorify God with your life. You want to experience freedom. You want to experience renewal. Stop the introspection and start praying the Lord's Prayer. Stop the analysis paralysis and pray, hallowed be your name. And watch God hallow his name in your life. Yeah. Hey, it might upset some things. <laughs> might upset a lot of things in your world. Might topple your kingdom. But in that, you're going to experience rescue and redemption and renewal and transformation. You're going to experience the joy and the peace and the grace and the love and the mercy of God through Jesus Christ. So First City Church, can our prayer life stop being introspection and analysis paralysis and can it be hallowed be your name because when we pray that hallowed be your name and we take hold of this promise when god glorifies his name he brings salvation Amen. we will change we will be set free we will experience joy in jesus this is the great promise for us in the lord's prayer let's pray